the script, so to speak, uh, to introduce his um, presentation and to introduce him. The title, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. Being stoic is sometimes associated with being disengaged and emotionless and with a philosophy of life that says, buck up and get over it. <coughs> However, while stoicism devotes considerable attention dealing with misfortune, loss, and negative emotions, the principal aim of stoic practice is to free ourselves from worry and attachment so that we can live happy and virtuous, excellent lives no matter what happens. Rather than advising withdrawal from the world, Stoics were often highly engaged in practical and political affairs and were among the first philosophers to embrace a cosmopolitan philosophy that recognized the inherent dignity of all human beings. Since you use share that principle and because many of us are worried or angry about the current state of affairs in American politics, there is much we can learn from Stoicism. Matt? Thanks for coming out to listen to the philosophy lecture on a Sunday morning. I'm going to keep it. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Let me clear my throat. Thanks for coming out. I'll try not to make this a philosophy lecture, and I'm going to try to keep it simple and not get into strange terminology or say strange things like Stoics think all emotions are irrational and wrong, because then we would spend the whole time just in a verbal dispute about what that means, so I'm not going to say that. Um, <coughs> and if you don't like that, then, well, I'll give you the advice for uh, dealing with you're not liking it. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm going to kind of introduce kind of what got me into thinking about this, and, and, then, and then we'll go through, and then I'll try to do a fairly brief run-through of some of the basic um, stoic ideas and, and how I've kind of connected them to my own uh, concerns about everything that's going on in our world. Um, and at the end, I'll recommend a book if you're interested. All right. Not to live in the past, but I'm going to talk about the election again, just for a moment. So a day or two after the presidential election, a picture showed up on my Facebook feed showing the singer-songwriter Ani DiFranco uh, at an election protest, and she had commandeered somebody's sign and was holding it up approvingly, and it said, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And I thought that was very clever, <laughs> but then, but then the little analytic philosopher alarm went off in my head. <laughs> and, I s and, and so, I re and it's always a mistake to respond to anything on Facebook, but I did. <laughs> and I said, well, why can't it be both? I was thinking about the Stoic, I mean, I was thinking about um, the Stoic philosophers who would say that Failing to accept the things we can't change is a surefire way to be miserable. And if we really can't change them, it is pointless to worry about them. Of course, whoever made the sign probably thought that we often get confused about what is and isn't under our control and that we can talk ourselves into inaction and a sense of helplessness by convincing ourselves that we cannot control or change things that we actually can. And that is a point that the Stoic philosophers would definitely accept. Um, for while the Stoics ad advise us to resign ourselves to fate, and we could talk for a long time about what that means, uh, one, one interpretation that, that is practically useful is that fate is what has already happened and so cannot be changed. You can't change the fact that it's already happened. 
So even though the Stoics advise us to resign ourselves to at least to fate in that sense, they do not ask us to give up on life, to withdraw from the world, or to stop trying to make the world a better place. Of course, they would also remind us that the goal is to try. You cannot, uh, success is not guaranteed, and that's just another hard fact of life the Stoics think that we should learn to accept, teach ourselves to accept. So I often teach about Stoicism in my college courses and have devoted some attention to uh, the Stoic, the Roman Stoic Seneca's views about anger in the book that I wrote about patience. I suspect that I'm a little bit of what William Irvine calls a congenital Stoic. <laughs> this is a term that he uses in this book, A Guide to the Good Life, the Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. So that's where I borrowed my title for today. And it's a very nice book because it's, he tries, it's, it's very non-technical. You can sit down and, 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 and breeze through it and uh, learn a little bit about uh, the history of ancient Greek philosophy. And, um, and, and he focuses on Roman Stoicism, which is, which is in a sense what I'm going to focus on without really getting into history. And they were more interested in the practical, the ethical aspect of Stoicism, which began as a, a philosophy in ancient Greece between 300 and 200 BC and then became uh, in a way the dominant philosophy outside, well the dominant pagan philosophy in Rome in ar around the first, uh, in the first century BC, or I'm sorry not first century BC, AD. So Seneca for example was born around 1 AD and then Epictetus who is the gentleman with his crutch, he's disabled, uh, on the front of the program was born around 50 or 60 AD, and um, and Marcus Aurelius, who was one of the you know important big Roman emperors, was uh, also a well-known Stoic. Um, Irvine says that if only he had been evangelical in his Stoicism, perhaps Stoicism would be more popular than it is. But uh, I don't know. I guess it's not an evangelical philosophy. All right, so. Back to my congenital stoicism. So the philosophy has always had its attractions for me ever since I first encountered it, even though I certainly don't always live up to it. So after the election, feeling bummed out about the results and feeling bummed out that so many people around me were bummed out and freaked out and grieving, I found my, you know, and it just felt like there was just a cloud over everything, you know, in my kind of, my little bubble. Um, so, but I found myself really wondering, you know, how much should we be freaking out? How bad is it? Um, I found myself needing to find a way to think clearly about how to deal mentally and practically with what so many people were saying, you know, was just, just this awful, terrible, s radically changed situation. Something awful had happened. So many more awful things were going to happen. So, you know, I found myself kind of thinking, well, how bad is it and what can or what should I do about it? I mean, those are huge questions that, I mean, they're questions that we can ask about lots of things. So, Stoicism gives us a way to think about these questions, which they believed would allow us to get on in the world in a general state of equanimity or tranquility, no matter what. The tra now, the tranquility that the Stoics sought was not some checked out state of blissful ignorance. Right, if that's what you're looking for, you just take a pill or something. <laughs> I mean, or, I mean, that's, that's not the kind of tranquility they were looking for. Rather, stoic tranquility is a balanced state of mind that they believed we can develop by having the right attitudes about what is up to us and what isn't up to us. If we can train ourselves to be concerned only with what is up to us and to accept the things that aren't up to us, then our tranquility and our happiness too, as they saw it, they saw these things as interrelated, will always be in our control. They also saw our happiness as tied up with how we act and what intentions we form. So virtue in the old uh, sense. Um, and so to maintain stoic tranquility is not only good for us, but it also turns out to be good for people around us. So that might sound too good to be true. You can always control, you know, you are always in control of our happiness. I mean, this is something we like to be told. We like to be told that we, we, we're in control. Um, but it might also, if you're kind of skeptical, sound too good to be true. 
since we may sometimes wonder where our happiness or our contentment would go if we lose certain comforts or lose certain abilities or certain social statuses or political freedoms or have to endure the tragic loss of loved ones. And we might even wonder whether it would be right to persist in happiness or tranquility in spite of some of those losses. Nevertheless, let me try to lay out some of the basic principles and practices of Stoicism and explain the basic way in which the Stoics would address those concerns and skepticisms I just mentioned. These Stoic ideas remain relevant and true and are consistent, I think, with our UU principles. All right, so some things are up to us and some are not. Know the difference. Epictetus says in his handbook that the fundamental distinction, this is how the, how, how his, the, with the handbook is a popular collection of things that Epictetus said, and it begins with this. Here's, here's the whole key, the fundamental distinction. So we have to grasp this fundamental dis distinction that some things are up to us and some things aren't. If we worry ourselves over things that aren't up to us, such worry is a waste and we will be miserable. According to Epictetus, what is up to us are our attitudes, our intentions, our desires, and other voluntary mental states. The things that are not up to us includes our bodies, our property, reputation, and social circumstances. Now you might say, so let me try to explain this by responding to what you might say about all that that we control all that mental stuff and we don't control all that non-mental stuff. Now you might say first off that we have some control over those latter things, body, property, reputation, social circumstances. We can eat healthy and exercise, take care of our possessions, lock the doors, try to make a good impression on other people and work hard to earn promotions and to be successful in the world. And that is all true, we can try. But misfortune and loss bad luck can incur in spite of our best efforts and we have to accept that the results are not entirely in our control. Furthermore, there are some things, there are some things that are completely out of our control, such as whether the sun will rise tomorrow. Right? So if you find yourself worrying about whether it will, just <coughs> stop. <laughs> I mean, easy to say, maybe hard to do if you're really worried about that, but I mean, you should find a way. You know, you know, look at Irvin's book and think, find, you know, something else to think about. Um, yeah. Uh, what makes Stoicism tricky is there are these things that it seems like we can exert some control over that are out there in the world, success, status, what other people think of us, right? But, but, but we forget that these things aren't completely in our control. And what's interesting is that the Stoics sometimes say very, I think, shockingly that, that the stuff out there doesn't really matter. We love when we, we think that it does, but I'll come back to that. So you might also object, on the other hand, I mean, he says, Sepictetus says that what's up to us are our intentions, our beliefs, our desires, our opinions, our perceptions. You might think, well, um, you know, those things don't always seem to be in our control. I mean, we sometimes are in bad moods or we have certain urges or impulses that just happen. And, and, and I think that's true, and I think they recognize that. I think what the Stoics have in mind is that what is up to us is what we make of and how we respond to those ref reflexive or instinctual feelings and urges. Just because I have an urge to eat a third donut or punch an annoying person in the face doesn't mean I have to act on that impulse. And I don't even have to approve of the impulse, right? I could have an impulse and think, well, that's wrong, and I'm not gonna do that, and I should find a way to root out that impulse if I can. I can decide that impulse is unhealthy or unfair and try to find a way to quash it. The Stoics recommend various strategies to do this, ranging from simply waiting for the urge to pass to changing our perspective on what has annoyed or tempted us. So for example, to look at it in a way that makes the urge seem ridiculous. Um, or in engaging in self-deprecating humor. For example, Epictetus suggests that if someone insults us, Instead of getting angry, we should point out some other flaw we have. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
he gives this wonderful example in his, Irvine gives this wonderful example in his book. He was talking to s at a philosophy conference and talking to somebody who he thought was about to fly, who was saying that they were going to cite him in, his in their work on political philosophy, some political philosophy work. And then they said to him, right to his face, I can't, I can't decide whether I should depict you as being misguided or evil. <laughs> and so Irvine, who's been trying to become a m more stoic, said, well, why couldn't it be both? <laughs> <laughs> so if we get angry, I mean, what, what happens is that somebody insults us or says something, or, or says something that we find offensive or, or whatever, and our impulse is to get really mad, really upset, maybe exchange insults. Um, and like time and again, what Epictetus and other Stoics point out is that the anger is always futile. And if we get angry or exchange insults, then in a sense, we let the insulter win. They take control of our mind. All right. So the Stoics hold that if we master this skill at distinguishing between what is up to us and what is not and train ourselves to accept what we can't control, we will be able to bear much hardship with equanimity and also be able to enjoy good fortune without becoming addicted to luxury. So the Stoics, unlike some other ancient uh, movements, they weren't ascetics. Um, they did sometimes advise us to engage in voluntary self-denial so that we can better appreciate what we do have. But they didn't think that simply because, they Stoics didn't think that simply because external stuff isn't where the important good in life is. The important good in life is about what you do and how you act and 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 about virtue, and about treating and, and, and trying to treat others well, and so having nice things is not part of part of happiness in the strict sense in their view, but just because they thought that they didn't think that you couldn't enjoy a wonderful banquet, like we'll go into in a little bit, or things like that. You didn't have to deny yourself, but you had to recognize that if you become, you know, as it were, addicted or dependent on or come to expect, you know good material things in life, then this sets you up for disappointment since these things can pass. All right. So all stoic practical advice, I think, can be understood as an application of the fundamental distinction between what's up to us and what's not up to us. And by focusing on what we can control, we can limit and overcome negative emotions, including anger, grief, envy, anxiety, and fear, which almost always are directed at things we can't control. This enables us to focus on what we can control and thereby to focus on responding to both the good th and bad things that happen in life in the most excellent way we can. For example, when a loved one has died, another frequent topic, um, for the Stoics. Um, instead of being wrecked by grief, we can remember the good things about this person and be thankful that we had a chance to know, excuse me, and love this person at all, and also remember that this person wouldn't want us to be consumed by grief. Seneca says this um, in, in, in attempting to console someone else, that if the person would have wanted us to be consumed and destroyed by grief, then that person was rather selfish and so doesn't deserve our grief. The Stoics aren't against grief per se. The Stoics aren't against grief per se. It sometimes sounds like that. They recognize that the pangs of grief are natural and often unavoidable, but they are against being consumed by grief and allowing ourselves, in this sense, to be consumed by gr grief in their sense completely is to become bitter, insensitive, irresponsible as a result of our losses, right? That's what they're concerned about, is being so consumed, whether it's by grief or anger, to the point where you cannot, well, you know, practice being a good person, yeah, and function, yes. All right. <laughs> social duty, okay, so social duties and human dignity. So the Stoics held that humans should not be equated with their talents, their possessions or social status, 
all of those things can change or be lost, and yet the person who previously had them would still be that person in some sense. Like many ancient Western philosophies, they regarded our ability to reason and deliberate as the distinguishing feature of humanity, and it is this basic rational ability which makes it possible for us to put the Stoic philosophy into practice and to cultivate Stoic virtue. It is this ability to reflect or deliberate which gives every human life fundamental dignity on their view. So every life is because of this ability that we're all capable of, which makes us worthy of respect. And this view, this the, the view, w whether that argument works out for all the cases of humans, the idea that all humans have dignity is an important development in the history of, of uh, philosophy since it rejects the elitism, classism, and other hierarchical views of human worth that of human worth that can be found in competing philosophies, including those of Plato and Aristotle, of course, the, uh, the ancient idea of the caste system and, and much Hindu thought. So the Stoics saw themselves as cosmopolitans, as citizens of the world who happened to live in particular cities and states. Of course, um, every once in a while, the uh, Roman uh, bureaucrats would uh, decide that they didn't like philosophy and exile the philosophers. Uh, Seneca spent eight years at one point in exile, but came back and was, um, if you've ever learned about Seneca, was uh, very engaged in politics. It didn't work out very well for him at the end. He was an advisor to Nero. Nero, he tried to retire um, before Nero could kill him, and, uh, and he did retire. And then somebody, con and then Nero's new advisors convinced them that Nero was had been plotting against him. So he was, uh, yeah, they didn't like that. But he took it well, apparently, as a <laughs> as a Stoic. <laughs> he was very successful, though. He was a successful playwright. He was uh, uh, an something what we would call an investment banker. So he wasn't kind of like a. They interestingly weren't like the ep Epicureans who believed in kind of pursuing the, a, a life of pleasure and kind of you know cultivating your own garden, who the Stoics thought really were kind of socially checked out. Um, all right. All right, so they saw themselves as cosmopolitans. They also believe that because humans are social beings, we have a basic responsibility to be just and hospitable to others, no matter who they are or where they're from. Thus, even though it may seem that Stoicism advocates a kind of detached, go-with-the-flow philosophy, accept fate, and all that, they would not say that we should simply ignore the injustices done by others or the plight of those who suffer from, injust from those injustices. Um, if someone does wrong and we are in a position to respond to that wrong, we should try to correct the injustice. We do not, however, accomplish this by getting angry, but by rather by taking practical steps to stop the wrongdoer or to help those who have been wronged. Anger, according to Seneca, is completely unnecessary and will simply cloud our judgment and lead us to take unwise corrective actions. So if someone we know is racked with grief, for example, to take another kind of case, we should try to comfort them and not simply say, buck up. As you might think a stoic would say, right? I mean, unless that's the way that, unless you happen to know that that particular person will be best comforted by, you know, a slap on the butt and a buck up, you know. Um, yeah, we should comfort other people when they need comfort. But we should not let ourselves also get upset. This, I mean, this is, people disagree about this, but the Stoics say, if you're trying to comfort somebody who's angry or grieving, you shouldn't become angry or grieve yourself because then you won't be able to provide the right kind of comfort. Stoics are sometimes, okay, so a couple people chuckled about Stoic joy. I heard it. I mean, it sounds, yeah, how could that be? Think of Stoic, the Stoic with the stiff upper lip, right? Stoics are sometimes depicted as detached, unemotionless creatures who bear the pain of the world with a stiff upper lip. This mischaracterization is perhaps due to the amount of energy the Stoics, especially Epictetus, expend on trying to get us to prepare ourselves to accept loss and misfortune. But Epictetus insists that the Stoic stage is the sage is the wise person. The sage is not unfeeling like a statue. 
rather by eliminating or at least minimizing negative emotions, by accepting what cannot be changed, the Stoics think we will be better able to experience joy, wonder, and gratitude. We will be ready to delight in our friendships and in moments of good fortune and of beauty and be thankful for what we have. The point of this is not to grow, you know, to be happy with what we have is not to grow complacent or to settle for whatever miserable lot in life we have, but rather to be able to see that as long as we have our wits about us, we can find good in the world and continue to try to be good. And if we can learn to appreciate the many things we take for granted, and here's an example that Irvine gives in his book, speaking of after his mother had a stroke and he was trying to take care of her. So the things we take for granted, even very basic things, such as the ability to swallow food and water. This can, this can take the sting out of the things we have lost and that we cannot change. All right, so back to my question. How bad is it? And what can or what should I do about it? So I don't want to digress by getting into the concerns and objections I have about specific values, statements, and policy positions of the current administration. Even though as long as I'm not a collectioneering, I could. But supposing that I do, suppo okay, so supposing I do have legitimate concerns and objections that seem to call for action politically or any other way, what can or what should I do? Before even starting to come up with solutions and plans, it strikes me that there are several things the Stoics would want me and anyone else in my position to bear in mind. Number one, there is no point in getting upset that other people have different values and beliefs or say things that I might find offensive. Simply getting upset isn't going to change anything except to make me miserable. Remember that other people generally say and do what they think is appropriate or right. That doesn't, of course, make them right. In some cases, the best thing to do is to pity silently their error and move on. I'm channeling the Stoics here. However, if there are good reasons to try to get those people to change their values or beliefs, if there's a need to call them out, then I should try to do that in the best way I can. But I should also choose my battles wisely and remember that the battles I choose may result in an external loss. The Stoics would say that if I've given it my best, then I have still won the internal victory. Epictetus warns us that if we are true philosophers, true Stoics, well, first, people are going to make fun of us for being Stoics. Hey, Mr. Stoic. How's your helmet fit today? <laughs> right. But also, if we are true philosophers, he says that we will speak and argue rarely because we will recognize that persuasion depends as much on context as on the quality of our arguments. I mean, he gives examples, and he says if you're at a party with a bunch of you know, non-intellectuals, then, you know, just keep it to yourself. You know, um, you know go, you know, if the, if the conversation becomes really vulgar, go slip into a corner and, you know, read your Seneca. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, I th and I think the idea is not, it's not do not engage with the enemy, but it's something like more like choose your battles wisely and recognize, you know, that, you're not, you know, you're unlikely to win a political argument with a, a heated member of the opposition, you know, if, you've, if you're like eight beers into Saturday night at the bar. Just, you know. That's the way I take it. Number two, politics is often adversarial and involves a lot of sometimes illogical rhetoric. If I get involved in politics, I had better get ready for insults, heated disagreements, failure, and alternative facts. <laughs> That's just part of it. We all know this. It's always been this way. If I really can't handle such conduct without getting furious, depressed, afraid, etc., 
then it might be wiser for me to find a different way to engage, such as providing support to those who are better at politics than I am, or any of the other ways that other, you know, we can talk about later. No. So the, the point here is know thyself, right? Um, but also know to the extent that you can what you are getting yourself into and prepare. Um, three, as bad as things might seem to me, if I'm feeling really bogged down, I should remind myself of how much worse things could be. As above, as above, this, now this is not so that I become complacently content, but so that I can restore myself to a state of equanimity and perhaps experience a healthy dose of gratitude, awe, or joy so that I can again think clearly about my intentions and plans and act wisely. Number four, do not allow yourself to be devastated by mistreatment, loss, or failure. Ask instead, what can I learn from this? Epictetus has this nice, he says everything has, everything has two handles. And you've got to try to learn to grab the thing by the handle by which it's more easily borne. Because in a sense, if it's already happened, there's no point in making it worse than it has to be. By which it's more most easily born. Yeah. So what can I learn from this? Number five. Finally, what I should do depends on what I can do. That depends on my abilities, resources, my other responsibilities. I should never work myself into feelings of guilt, shame, despair, anger, and so on, about things that are beyond what I can control or try to influence. At the same time, I should not use the fundamental distinction as a way to make excuses or to rationalize inaction or apathy. I can continue to learn and improve myself, and in this way, things that I cannot do today may, be th may become things that I can do tomorrow.